Thank you, Dr. Aiken, for your kind words. Um, it's good to be here, although it's raining pretty bad. And I'm used to the rain in Miami. I'm not used to the cold weather. But it's few memories of my time here at Southeastern. Um, I love this institution. I love the people who serve here. I love Dr. Aiken and so many who have invested in my life. I can't believe it's been so long. 20, we landed here 2014. And after all these many years, I long to come back and visit and catch up with old friends. Um, this institution, this seminary has had a great impact in my life, and I'm grateful for it. Well, if you have your Bibles, let's open them up to the book of Philippians, chapter 3. like for us this morning to look at the first 11 verses of Philippians, chapter 3. I will read out loud, you follow along in your copy of God's Word. Philippians chapter 3, verse 1 says, In addition, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. To write to you again about this is no trouble for me, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for the dogs. Watch out for the evil workers. Watch out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision, the ones who worship by the Spirit of God, boast in Christ Jesus, and do not put confidence in the flesh. Although I have reasons for confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he has grounds for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, regarding the law, a Pharisee, regarding zeal, persecuting the church, regarding the righteousness that is in the law, blameless. But everything that was a gain to me, I have considered to be a loss because of Christ. More than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Because of him, I have suffered the loss of all things and considered them as dung, so that I may gain Christ and be found in him, having, not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. My goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. Let us pray. Father, thank you for your word that never returns void, that accomplishes your will. And I pray that your people here today will be encouraged, challenged, that we would be about the one thing that Paul's about, Christ, him crucified. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. As a son of Cuban immigrants, I have always had a fascination with hearing my parents talk about what life was like in Cuba. My father, who was born in a rural farming village on the east side of the island all my life painted pictures for me of what this little dot on the world map was like. And one of those images that registered in my mind, even as a little boy, was a river that flowed through the community. This river was not only described to me as beautiful, but also life for those who live there. For from it, they drink and they bathe and irrigate their crops. And so it was in 2013, with great expectation, I had the privilege of visiting that village. For the first time in my life, I arrived there and I met people who were related to me, cousins. I was taking in my heritage, so here's where my father is from. But there's one thing that I needed to see. I needed to see that river. And it blew me away when I saw it. I had never seen anything like it. The clarity of the water was a sight to see. The sun pierces the waters, casting shadows on the floor, as if the water wasn't even there. It was that still, and yet that, that um, clear. And when I thought that the river was just about two feet deep, a cousin whom I just met dove and paddled all the way down to the river floor. The clarity in that river was amazing. 
Three years later, my wife was able to come with me, and I took her to the same village where my father was from, and I wanted her to see the river. But when we arrived, unfortunately, it had been raining, and we found the river murky, full of debris, taking away all its beauty and its clarity. I was disappointed. I share this story with you today, this morning, because of a pressing question that I like to bring before you. And it's this, I wonder if the river of the gospel that runs through our churches, our institutions, our convention, our very own lives flows with such beauty and clarity. I wonder if there's any debris of legalism, antinomianism, everything in between politics, social and gender issues. I wonder if, if there's anything that's unhealthy that is blurring up gospel waters? I believe it's an important question to ask because in our text, the Apostle Paul seems to be making an appeal to the church of Philippi and to every single one of us that we must be about gospel clarity, that we must get the gospel right because truth is history has shown that we're always at risk of twisting it or even losing it, nothing new. I'm teaching through the book of Judges right now at Providence Road, and here's what we know about the book of Judges from the very beginning, that the generation after Joshua abandoned the Lord, just one generation. And so for Paul, it is of vital importance that his brothers and sisters get the gospel right, and so it is for us. So as we look at this text, I want us to first see this first truth. Number one, gospel clarity protects us against heresy. Paul begins verse one by saying, in addition, my brothers and sisters, he is bringing in a new idea. He is introducing it by reminding his brothers and sisters once again that they have a reason to rejoice in the Lord. But Paul says two things in the second part of verse one that I think is very important, that is very easily overlooked, that actually I think drives the 11 verses. First he says, to write to you again about this, he says, it is no trouble for me. The question is, what is this about this, or other translation would say, the same things. What is Paul referring to? Some would suggest that he is reemphasizing the call to rejoice in the Lord, but I'm convinced, as others are, that the same things or these things that he is talking about are the things that he has previously taught them, the gospel. In other words, he's writing again to help them understand with more clarity the gospel with all its implications. And here's what he says about that process of writing once again. He says, it is no trouble for me. It is not a burden for him to continually teach, write, speak, clarify the truths of the gospel for those who have the gospel. Same thing that he desired for the church in Ephesus. When he tells them in chapter 3, verses 16 through, through 19, that he prays that they would be strengthened with power through his spirit in their inner being so that they may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. That's Paul's desire. He indeed had no other message. Paul had no other topic. He tells the the church at Corinth, he says, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. This is his one thing. And Paul, he tells them why it is no trouble for him to be about these things, about the gospel itself, because he says it is a safeguard for you. It is no trouble for me, and it is a safeguard for you. How important is that for us to just take in? The truth is that if the gospel is not before us, it most definitely will end up behind us. And if it ends up in the rearview mirror, we will be left with a diluted gospel that eventually becomes no gospel at all. If the gospel loses its clarity, it will lose its redemptive beauty and power among us. But this idea of safeguard really needs to land on our hearts because in light of the text, 
primarily we find that Paul is concerned, we, we would rightly be concerned with the potential twisting or the heresy that is out there. But I want us to also understand that there's the danger of the heresies and the errors creeping up from within, from our very own hearts. The threat is always potentially in us. In subtle ways, we can start to twist the gospel, add to the gospel, distort the gospel, and be even too blind to even notice it. That is why we must be about the one thing. We must pursue gospel clarity. Where you say, hey, well, I have the gospel straight. We won that battle a long time ago in the SBC. Well, well, listen, just like in the book of Judges, man, this sin cycle, sin has a way of just rearing its head and the enemy is on the prowl, on the attack. Listen, there was a day early on in our convention where there were churches who were singing praises to Jesus and condoning slavery. That is lack of gospel clarity. There was a day where, where at some point, somehow, liberalism invaded our convention, our seminaries, and practically took over. How did that happen? Lack of gospel clarity. There's lack of gospel clarity even when your politics is informing your gospel instead of the gospel informing your politics. You might just end up endorsing Paula White's latest book. And so we are even in danger of diluting the gospel when we find identity primarily in our race than in Christ. When Providence Road was, we planted nine years ago, four years in, in God's kindness, we acquired a property. It was given to us by a church where we were renting that was dying had about 15 members at the time, Spanish speakers there, a Hispanic church. And once we became owners, I began to dig up all the history of Coral Baptist Church, as it was called. And I started to find information that is teaching me about Miami itself. The area where the church was at was known as Little Georgia. Like, really? So people bought second homes from Georgia. Snowbirds would come down, spend the winter in South Florida, but eventually people moved down. They planted this church, Coral Baptist, back in 1954, if I'm not mistaken. In the heyday, Coral Baptist had a 1,000 members. It was packed. But throughout the years, into the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, the church started to dwindle, started to die. The community was changing. Communism in Cuba primarily brought an influx of Hispanics, of Cubans into South Florida. And today, what what was known as Little Georgia is Little Havana, But the community changed, and the church died. You could come up with all kinds of reasons. Well, economics, um, culture, language. And as I'm looking at all this, I'm like, what, what was the problem in this church? And I understood that the only problem was a gospel problem. They were missing the very reason why they existed in that community and in very subtle ways without even knowing it. They had catered to a gospel of their liking and not the gospel that Jesus gave them to proclaim. So gospel clarity protects us against heresy. Yeah, the heresy out there, as we'll see in the rest of this chapter, but the heresy that also creeps within should humble us. Secondly, gospel clarity grounds our confidence in Christ alone. We see this in verses 2 through 6. In verse 2, Paul warns against those who place their confidence in themselves and not in Christ. The church of Philippi was being threatened by a group of Jews called the Judaizers who were willing to accept Jesus but believed that the gospel demanded much more than just faith alone in Christ alone. It demanded obedience to the law, the upholding of traditions, 
the upholding of ritual, especially that of circumcision as a requirement for salvation. And I'm sure that many of them had good intentions, zeal for the things of God. But because Paul is so fixed on bringing clarity to the gospel, because only then does it have power, he violently warns against their twisted ways. So he condemns them with three imperatives to describe these Jews or these Judaizers. He first says in verse 2 there, he says, watch out for the dogs. This is something that's very hard for us to understand because in our day, dogs are not only a man's best friend, he's actually your, your family member. i never forget a few years ago at Providence Road, after the service, I'm, I'm looking into the mommy room. We have a window in the back of the sanctuary and a whole bunch of moms there with their strollers. And one of the strollers has a dog in it. <laughs> like it's over for us. So how could they understand? <laughs> Watch out for the dogs. The Apostle Paul, he calls these men dogs. It would have been of the greatest offenses. A dog was a despised animal, a filthy animal, a disruptive animal that wandered into places where they did not belong. And Paul, who has so much zeal for the gospel and for the clarity of the gospel, that, that he says, watch out for those dogs because they come in to disrupt, to distort. But he also says, not just watch out for the dogs, he says, watch out for those evil workers, those who whose ultimate mission is to distort and trample the redemptive purposes of God in Christ Jesus. Whoever is about that, Paul says, is an evildoer, an evil worker. They align themselves more with the cause of the enemy of the cross, even if it's masqueraded by Christianity. Watch out for the dogs. Watch out for the evil workers. Watch out for those who mutilate the flesh. He compares them to pagans, because it was the pagans who mutilated the flesh. The Judaizers believed that this external, this external physical practice of circumcision was necessary to find acceptance with God. And therefore, if that were true, that is a denial of the gospel of grace in Christ alone. And Paul would have none of it. For Paul, he would say those people are dangerous because they have a different gospel. There is no clarity there. Therefore, we'll have power to save, to transform, to build and edify the church, God's people. Then Paul defines for us in contrast to those Judaizers, who are those that truly, truly are and have saving faith. He says in verse 3, he says, for we are the circumcision, those who have been circumcised not in the flesh, but in the heart. He says that those who have been circumcised in the heart, they worship by the Spirit of God, not by external means, but from within, from the heart. And they find no value in ritual, no value in ceremony. They've tasted grace and have been transformed in such a way that worship flows from them because of the indwelling spirit. They worship by the spirit of God, and they also, in verse two there, it says that they boast in Christ Jesus. Those who boast in Christ have experienced what it means to be poor in spirit, to be bankrupt before the Lord. They have tasted grace in the perfect finished work of Christ in their stead, and they understand that God achieved for them what they could never achieve for themselves in their best days. This is why Paul would say in Galatians 6.14, but as for me, I would never boast about anything except the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. The world has been crucified to me through the cross and I to the world. So here Paul is speaking, and, and he says that that, that they, that these men, in verse 2 here, where he says, look out for those who mutilate the flesh, for we are the circumcision. We are those who put confidence in Christ. So while the Judaizers put their confidence in the flesh, 
Paul says, I've put my confidence in Christ. And he rolls out his credentials, if you will, in order to size it up against these Judaizers to say, well, those are your credentials. Look at mine and what I, what I, and how I value those credentials. Paul says there in verse five that, that he was circumcised on the, eighth, on the eighth day. He was circumcised according to Jewish ritual. The timing was right, and it was defining his inheritance as a Jew. And Paul says, look, I, I put no confidence, no confidence in this religious right. He also said that he, is, that he was from the nation of Israel. He wasn't a proselyte, but he was a descendant of the Old Testament patriarchs. He had birth rights. And yet Paul says, I put no confidence in my ethnicity. He also says he, he puts no confidence in his privilege because he was from the tribe of Benjamin, from the most respected tribe, from the more distinguished tribe in all of Israel. Paul says, I put no confidence in that either. Furthermore, he says, I don't even put confidence in my pedigree. He was a Hebrew born of Hebrews. He was of the highest ranking among his peers. He came from a, a, a respected Jewish family. He grew up within the Jewish culture and tradition, studied under the best Jewish rabbis. He was a distinguished man. If Paul would have lived in our day, he would have gone to Harvard, been a U.S. senator, and part of a family with a very well-known last name. And yet Paul had no confidence in his privileges. All those things were things that that gave him privilege, and he said, I place no confidence in that. But in the text, we find that he also has no confidence in his accomplishments, the things that he achieved. He had no, no confidence, in verse 5, in his religious authority. He, regarding the law, a Pharisee, he made it to the top. He had the degrees and lived the lifestyle of a Pharisee in relationship to the law. He was committed to pure religion and lived to maintain a lengthy list of rules, and he did. But he says, I have no confidence in my accomplishments of myself as a Pharisee made it to the top. He says he had no confidence in his zeal either because regarding the righteousness that is in the law, he said blameless. He persecuted the church. He found no, no confidence in his zeal. He found no confidence in his law keeping. The apostle Paul was stripped of all confidence in his flesh. All of his privileges and all his accomplishments, he found confidence in none of them. So that standing alone for him was Christ with his privileges and his accomplishments for Paul and for everyone who believes in Jesus. You see, the only worthy credentials are those who belong to Christ. His privileges as the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity who came to this earth to live, to die for our sins, it was his privileges and his accomplishments, his perfect obedience, his perfect law-keeping, his perfect zeal, his perfect sacrifice, his perfect life. Paul wants to ground these brothers and sisters and that the clarity that they would have in the gospel would bring them to a place where they would have confidence and place their trust and their joy solely and fully in the person and work of Jesus Christ. How about you this morning? Where is your confidence this morning? Do you have confidence in your moral standards, in your zeal for God, in your tradition, in your politics, in your country, in your race, in your degrees? See, sometimes we theologically know that our confidence should be in Christ. But I wonder if in our practice we live what we know.
it's, it's a humbling thing to even think that we could lack gospel clarity because we place too much emphasis, too much confidence in other things other than Christ. And I pray that by God's grace, he would move us to a place we would wake up to die to ourselves every day where Christ would be central in our lives, where he becomes the one person, our one savior and rescuer, that his gospel would be our one message, our one boast, our one confidence. Gospel clarity protects us against heresy from the outside and from within, and gospel clarity grounds our confidence in Christ alone. But lastly, I want us to see how gospel clarity will save sinners and exalt the Savior, verses 7 through 11. Paul wants them to understand the beauty of salvation, and he uses his own life as an example. In verses 7 through 11, Paul further explains what saving faith looks like through the realities of his own salvation. He considers his list of privileges and his list of accomplishments. And there was a day where these privileges and these accomplishments were his life, his very identity. In other words, everything he thought was credited to him to be made right with God, he actually realized it was a debt. That those very things that he trusted in actually moved him further away from God instead of drawing him near to God. So he realized that by God's grace, that all the credit needed was not found in him, but found in someone else, Christ. For Paul, it is all Christ for him. So he responds to that reality of the glorious salvation that he received, that is for all to receive. He says, well, here's how I process this in my life, this glorious salvation that I have received. He says in verse 7 and 8, he says, but everything that was gained to me, I have considered to be a loss because of Christ. More than that, I consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord because of him. I have suffered the loss of all things and consider them as dung. It's a chasm as far as worth and value. All his accomplishments, all his credentials, he considers them as dung. I think the vulgarity in Paul's words are very intentional because he doesn't want to leave any room for self-righteousness and any trust in our works in our own building of our own kingdom. The power of the gospel has taken Paul to a place where his self-righteous kingdom has collapsed. All affections for human achievements, praises, and earthly possessions died to him. And from then on, he understood that fellowship with Christ, union with Christ, and all the benefits of Christ's life His death and resurrection was now his life. What other message does Paul have? What other argument? Years ago, I built for my wife an herb garden. She loves to cook. If you're ever in Miami, just hook us. We'll hook you up with some nice Cuban food. I built this herb garden for her with all these herbs that she likes, the oregano and the rosemary and during that time, she had bought a Walmart, or, or I think somebody gave her a vase that had strawberries on the outside, a nice vase. There were supposed to be some seeds in there that were strawberry seeds that we would eventually have a strawberry bush and we'd be able to eat some strawberries in. But that, that, that never germinated, it never grew. I built this herb garden, but one day I'm looking at the vase who's that's there on the, you know, by the terrace on the floor, and I see something growing. I said, hey, the strawberry plant has grown. I pick up that strawberry plant, I remove it from the vase, and I put it in the herb garden, and you know, explaining to the kids, so this is the strawberry plant that they gave mom, and eventually 
it's eight of us, we might just share, I mean, just have one each perhaps if it gives eight strawberries here. Um, but, but this plant begins to grow, begins to grow. And it's like, it's growing large and it's bigger than all the other plants. And, and, and I'm like, man, you know, and you know, flowers bud and I'm, you know, telling the children, look, look, from this flower, a strawberry is gonna grow. And that flower buds and grows, and that flower falls and dies, and no strawberries. And one Sunday morning, before church, I'm outside in the yard, and I'm you know, watering the herb garden. I was very proud of it, by the way. Um, and I look at this plant. I'm like, this thing is ugly, man. And I'm like, wait a minute. I don't think this is a strawberry bush. I take out my phone and I'm like, you know, strawberry plant. And I, now, now that's a pretty plant. This thing is like flat, it's, you know, extended like this, it's taking over everything. And, and I'm like, could it be? See, because when I lived here in Youngsville, I'm gonna boast here a little bit. I should boast only in Christ, but I had the best lawn in the neighborhood. And, and, and I, would, I would lay down on the grass to pull out crabgrass. And I'm like, could this, this is crabgrass in my herb garden. Here's my point. All the affection for that crabgrass that I thought was a strawberry bush was gone. There was nothing else to explain. There was nothing else to defend or, you know, to make the argument for the tree for my kids to know. Hey, it really is. No, it didn't belong anymore in the herb garden. So what I do, I grabbed it from the roots and I threw it out and it was done away with. In a sense, this is how Paul feels. He has found delight and joy in a savior and he compares everything in his life that he valued he finds, he finds it as rubbish, as dung, and he does away with it. And that only is possible because of the clarity that Paul had on what the gospel was and who is the one who paid his debt and who canceled his debt and who reconciled him to God. And this is the only gospel that could save sinners and make much of Jesus. So Paul, he's explaining of all that has been afforded to him. He never gets over it. So he says in verse nine, he speaks of his justification. He says, not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that, that through faith in Jesus Christ. Paul understands in full delight that he is now found in Christ, hidden in Christ. That he, along with every true believer, does not approach God on the basis of their own achievements and their own righteousness. But now every believer approaches the throne room of grace covered with the righteousness of Christ. A righteousness that is alien. A righteousness that is external because it belongs to Christ. And by faith in him, God has imputed righteousness to the sinner who has trusted in him. And Paul says, that's what the gospel does. That's what the gospel did to me. He never got over such amazing grace. In light of who he was, an insolent opponent, the chief of sinners, the enemy of the, gro uh, of the cross, but grace was extended to him. Paul says, I was justified. And he also says, my goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Paul says, man, I was justified, declared innocent by Christ, brought into the family of God, but I'm also being sanctified. It's not just set apart, holy, positionally, one who is hidden away in Christ, but he's saying, I am progressively being sanctified and becoming more and more aware of my union with Christ, and I have a deeper, sweeter, more obedient fellowship with Christ in such a way that I want to fellowship in his sufferings, even be conformed to his death. Paul says, I've been justified, I've been sanctified. And he also says, one day, I, along with all those who have trusted in Jesus, will be glorified. 
And he says in verse 11, assuming I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. Believers are to long for a glorious end and a final resurrection. One day the hope of glory will become every believer's reality and they shall see the Savior face to face. Brothers and sisters, we need to be reminded that the same glorious gospel that saved Paul, it's the same glorious gospel that saved us. It's the same glorious gospel that can save sinners to the glory of Christ. And those realities, being about this one thing, this one message, this one truth, should stir our hearts and our affections to be obsessed with it, to never get tired of proclaiming it, explaining it, that we never move on to other things. Gospel is for my salvation and not for my sanctification. Paul never got tired of explaining and teaching. Neither should we. So let us make sure that we're not chucking logs, debris, into the beautiful river of the gospel. Let us make sure that we're not entertaining the debris in that river. Because what unbelievers need and what believers need is gospel clarity so that we can be in awe and so that sinners would see that Christ is sufficient, that he is all we need, and he is the one who can save us from sin and death. And we, the church, have been called to proclaim it. Let us pray. Father, thank you for your word. It never returns void. I just pray, Lord, through the, your spirit, that your people here would be encouraged, challenged, and stretched. Unite us like never before under the banner of the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen.